Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the second session of the day, day two of DDC's uh, Global Debt Business Summit. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, present the next panel, uh, which will be tackling the uh, NPL situation uh, in Iberia, so Spain and Portugal. We've got a great panel lined up for you, and I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting discussion. So it's my pleasure to hand over to our moderator for today's session, uh, Tiago of VDA and uh, look forward to uh, this panel very much. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tiago Reymoreira. I'm a partner at the Banking and Finance VDA team. Um, I dedicate most of uh, my work to uh, the topic that we're discussing in this panel today. In fact, I've been working with NPLs for more than half of my professional life now. Um, uh, it's, I'm delighted to, to join this panel with, with the other members, some of which I know quite well from past transactions uh, and deals. Uh, and I'll immediately uh, pass on to each of them so they can introduce themselves as well before we kick off with, with the discussion. Perhaps, Paul, you may want to start introducing yourself, please. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Tai. Um, I'm head of advisory in, in Copernicus, um, based in, in Madrid. Um, Copernicus is a special servicer uh, focused on uh, secured MPLs uh, and distressed assets. Um, we're um, mainly, uh, started in Spain, uh, almost 10 million under management in Spain, but we're now in, in, in six countries, uh, mostly in Southern Europe, um, Italy, uh, Greece, um, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, and, and recently France, uh, and in Peru as well in, in, in LATAM. And uh, we've also just started a, a direct lending arm called Copernicus Credit. Pleased to meet you all. Uh, sorry, I, I think, uh, hi, my name is Guillermo Arquín. I'm a corporate finance partner uh, over at PwC. Um, I've got over 20 years of experience. I've been working over in the MPL uh, market ever since uh, everything started in Spain, so back in 2010. Um, I basically lead all of the corporate finance banking sector uh, business in Spain and uh, over in Latin America. And I also have been working over in all of the Southern European countries. You know? um, we've been doing, well, I've transacted more than about 100 billion euros of uh, REOs and MPLs, and I've uh, helped some about 20 banks dispose of their recovery uh, units in, all, all across uh, the world. The latest uh, deal that we closed was uh, yesterday, actually, in Greece, uh, which was the Alpha Bank deal. Bruno, do you want to, to take the lead now? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Bruno Carneiro. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of ServDebt. ServDebt is one of the leading servicers in Portugal. We also have a presence in, in Spain. And um, we've started back in 2007. Thank you, Bruno. Manuel, do you want to introduce yourself, please? True, sure, thanks, uh, Diago, and thanks for DDC for inviting us to, to be here. My name is Manuel Andrich. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for uh, Aura Asset Management. Aura is a small boutique uh, servicing company. We do focus only on residential scattered assets that they have, if they are real, some possession problems or squatters, and if they are MPLs, uh, obviously is that uh, uh, we have uh, no payment at all. Uh, we do, to, together with the legal approach to the problem, we do make social mediation with uh, self-employed uh, mediators. And we are managing now around 6,000 uh, RIOs and 3,000 MPLs. We are only operating in Spain and we are based uh, in Spain. I'm pretty sure a lot of people will know you already, but if you could introduce yourself. Sure, thank you, Tiago. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, DC, for inviting for the panel. Thank you, everyone that is attending and taking the time to be sharing this moment with us. 
My name is Pedro Valdemingues. I am the head of responsible for advisory at uh, Iporres Iberia for all the markets where we are established. Today we have uh, over 24 billion in the management. We are uh, one of the biggest independent services in the Southern Europe. And we do basically all products from A to Z under the servicing world. And here I am today to discuss with this uh, amazing panel some of the main hot topics of the moment. Okay, uh, thank you all for introducing yourselves. I think um, we will start with uh, an overall question around the market and the context, uh, the context uh, of, of these sort of transactions. I mean, there has been a lot going on over the past few years, uh, both in Portugal and in Spain. And um, perhaps I would start by Paul by asking you, what have you seen? in the past years, recent years, in terms of transactions alike in Spain? And what uh, can you tell us about your experience in those deals? How does the market look? Uh, and we'll start with that and then we'll hear it from the other panelists as well. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, well, I suppose as everybody knows, uh, when, when COVID hit, everything just stopped dead in their tracks. No, um, The market reactivated then in the last quarter of, of last year. Um, quite, quite strongly and um, the good thing was that all, um, the majority of those deals that came out are uh, closed no so uh, there was um, a matching of, of buyer and seller no in in the market no and um, so we had uh, explorer uh, from Sabadell um, around 300 million uh, uh, also Lurve uh, from Kaisha around 500 million SME corporate type portfolios which were acquired by Tilden Park uh, we had uh, Aurora, Project Aurora from Sabadell, um, and also the car uh, from, from, from BBVA, which were acquired by KKR. And then uh, there was a market which uh, started being an, an on-market transaction, uh, Project Higgs, the resident mortgage portfolio from, from Banco Sabadell. Uh, in the end, it went off market uh, and was bought in bilateral by, by Lone Star, around 500 million, I think, uh, in the end as well, no? On the secondary side, uh, we also had a secondary uh, sale from, from uh, Chenavari, uh, who sold all their exposure in Spain, uh, around four portfolios, uh, which was called the Wave and Zenith portfolio. That was uh, acquired by a new player in the market, um, a, a metric uh, together with Albrecht. Um, is, so, so that was interesting to see, to see a new player come, come to the market. Um, and that was kind of a uh, it was a mix, um, mostly in terms of value residential mortgages, uh, but it also had SME, both secured and unsecured. No, um, so I mean it's very, very positive. Uh, it was a difficult time to be pricing uh, loans because um, the real estate, um, you know, there, there wasn't uh, visibility in terms of closing prices post COVID. No, um, so I think basically that the, the the people that were that were more winning these type of portfolios were the people that were um, uh, more optimistic about uh, the, the real estate prices and the real estate values you know, uh, than, than others. You know? But it was a very difficult, it was a very difficult time to, to be pricing to be pricing portfolios. You no. Know? And the good thing was that it transacted, you no. Know? Uh, this year uh, Q1 was dead. Um, there was absolutely nothing happening. Um, so <laughs> we had we had plenty of time to uh, to work on our, our, our process and procedures and, and, and new markets and new things, no? Uh, so so uh, it was very quiet, um, you know, mainly was closings of the deals that happened in the last quarter, no? Um, what we did see is, um, you know, we were quite active in single names. Um, in, in the first quarter, we closed um, a hotel deal, single name in, in the Costa del Sol, MPL, um, five-star hotel. Um, and, and, you know, as the, as the year picked up, we are seeing... Uh, one of the banks being particularly active in selling um, single name uh, UTP hotel positions, which are, um, you know, quite difficult for them to manage with the COVID situation and with the, the distress in the Spanish hotel sector. Um, so we, we have seen um, Project Orion, which is that one we closed uh, with a client, uh, and there's a number of processes ongoing, which have, uh, um, which have hotel, hotel positions in it, Project Spain, Project Sun, Project Pegasus, no, uh, which which has, has brought some activity to the market, no? Then we've also seen a pickup of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, pipeline of, of, of projects again. Uh, so uh, at the moment, there's a, quite a big 
uh, an interesting deal from, from Santander called Project Talos, uh, 650 million uh, corporate SME um, uh, type portfolio. No? Um, mostly pre, pre COVID, uh, previous crisis, uh, MPLs, quite, quite distressed uh, situations. No? Um, so, I mean, I think they, we'll talk about the outlook later, um, but um, you know, I think uh, gen generally give you a head up, it's, it's, it's looking quite positive that, uh, that things are happening. I mean, it's good that things transacted last year and um, you know, that uh, gives uh, confidence then for, for sellers to come to the market knowing that the things will transact and that they will get um, you know, prices that they're, they're interested in. in. Um, so that's positive. Uh, Portugal, um, we're, we're a bit active there as well. We have things we were looking at quite a lot last year. Uh, there was um, a portfolio called Project Zip. Uh, it was more rail portfolios. Uh, so that was a, a portfolio uh, with uh, rented uh, residential assets, no? which was very interesting to, to analyze. Um, um, and then Project uh, Silk is a smaller deal, kind of rail portfolios. There's also some deals, um, you know, around um, ECS, which is a vehicle um, for um, quite, a, quite a lot of hotels in it, no? Um, and, that, and that, I think, is, is, is ongoing, no? And apart from that, some, some smaller secured deals, um, uh, secured and unsecured portfolios, no? But, but generally, generally pretty, pretty quiet in, in, in Portugal. I know the Portuguese guys can, can talk more about the market. <laughs> I'll ask uh, Bruno perhaps to, to comment on the Portuguese side as well. So we, we move yeah. with jurisdictions uh, now. And thank you, Paul. Bruno, uh, some of these names will be familiar to you, I'm pretty sure. But if you could talk about last year as well. Yeah, I'm um, picking up on where, where Paul uh, stopped. Um, well, as Paul was saying, uh, I think that the, the, the fact that we had COVID changed a bit the plans. Um, but uh, at the end of the year or towards the end of the year, we start seeing some things coming to market. As usual, banks wanted to close the transactions until year end, which in some cases is always a challenge. Um, but I would say that considering that we had COVID and of course Portugal is not the size of Spain and we need to take that into account. So you'll never see the same big deals as you see in Spain. Uh, I think we had a decent end uh, um, last quarter of uh, uh, 2020 um, with deals coming to market and with transactions being closed, which I think is always important. Uh, I, I, I must say that I was even a bit surprised um, because I was thinking that, like Paul was saying, you know, pricing on post-COVID, it becomes more challenging. But I was actually uh, a bit surprised that, you know, you could see uh, confidence in, in, in investors and in people wanting to buy portfolios. So you didn't really see a, an impact on the pricing side here. So I would say that the, the year was uh, considering that we had COVID that stopped transactions in the middle of the year. I think it, it ended uh, okay. Um, when you start speaking about this year, well, first quarter was pretty much quiet. You, you didn't see anything, but I think you, you are starting to see a, a building of a pipeline. So I would say that we expect to see uh, some transactions coming to market, both on the secured and on the unsecured side. And um, we'll see how, 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 how the market will progress. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite curious to see how people will, will start uh, looking, considering that we have some uncertainty in the market, um, on, more on the macroeconomic side. So I'm a bit curious to see how, how, how things will play on the second half of the year. Yeah. We, we with Pedro and are you, are you also curious to see Pedro how how this is going to evolve I mean it's we, we've only just started the discussion and we're hearing the the big question mark around pricing right how do we price a market which we don't know yet how is it going to react to the COVID exactly that's one of the main questions obviously everybody um, is very interested on how you're going to do it and just not to be too repetitive with what Paul and Bruno just said. We basically had very good years. Everybody was um, very um, used to have massive portfolios coming, all the countries. This was increasing in all the Europe region and outside of Europe as well, but we are more focused in Europe. And suddenly we all faced a shutdown. And the shutdown was across the board to all countries last year. 
So the beginning was quite surprising and it was even funny to see when the market started. It's not very different from this year, to be honest, because we are facing exactly the same curve where everything will come at the end of the year again. And we, it will be um, a lot of activity by then. Uh, but last year was a little bit different because nobody was really sure if there would or not had any needs in terms of adjustments to pricing. And obviously we are talking about IRRs, we are talking about haircuts on potential real estate on secure transactions, uh, workout solutions for ongoing concern companies. It was, it was very, very challenging. And we even felt the beginning of the first processes in both countries, the price is a little bit over the, all, all over the place. After that, we got the trend on the, on the markets where people start to understanding more or less where the other bidders were coming and quickly the market was adapting to the level to a homogeneous, more homogeneous levels of pricing. This happened in both countries and it, the only difference between Portugal and Spain, it was very curious to see is that Spain decreased the competition and Portugal stayed at the same levels. We even had portfolios with 11 bids that was massive, even more than almost before COVID. And the good thing then that Paul also mentioned, he's had all the transactions that came to market, most of them that went to the BOFAs in both countries were actually closed. So this means like Bruno was mentioning, the commitment from the investor is still there. We felt the investors still have appetite and, 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 and power to invest. They were just holding it up a little bit and waiting for the market to come. This year, we felt more or less the same at the beginning. Everybody was a little bit more enthusiastic by the fact that late last year was very active. So everybody thought, okay, so 2021 will be positive. We'll have a little bit more deals at the beginning of the year. And then we'll maybe come to a 70% normal year, as we call it the normal year. <laughs> but no, not yet. At least uh, Portugal and Spain. There's not the same effect in Greece. We're also in Greece. And Greece is a little bit the opposite. We feel Greece is picking up a little bit faster in these two countries. They didn't have the massive uh, outcome of the end of last year, obviously. But we believe, and, and as Tiago was asking, we believe the pricing will continue to be a challenge in any country in very different ways. Because people now these days read a lot about bubbles. Nobody really knows what's going to happen and if it's going to happen. And so for, from our view so far, I think we need to sit tight, continue to do as much as possible of our analysis in order to try to get it uh, accurate and be able to be sure that uh, investors don't lose confidence on yeah. the countries where we are operating and investing. Yeah, and let me, let me pick, it up, pick it up where, where you've mentioned the, the analysis and the assessment and Guillermo uh, ask you for, for your opinion here as well. Uh, as as a, a special advisor um, uh, on PwC side, um, as we are advisors as well, how how have you seen these past transactions? When I mean COVID was already there, uh, the assessments needed to be made. There was a big question mark. What does your experience for the past past year tells you about this? Yeah, so we we, we basically come from. Uh, at a time like uh, everyone else was saying where um, Spain was super liquid. There were huge amounts of deals uh, coming into the market on a regular basis. Uh, you were running from one deal to the other and everyone uh, felt uh, very comfortable with the uh, business plans that uh, guys like uh, Paul, Bruno and Pedro were preparing. No? Um, we, we all felt that, that uh, that, that the work that uh, the services were, uh, were doing was splendid and that therefore uh, we investors felt uh, that, that the pricing was correct. Now, COVID came around uh, and everything dried up, uh, as we were mentioning before. No? Uncertainty started uh, plunging through the market and we suddenly uh, started feeling that uh, maybe the situation or the macro situation of each of the countries could be uh, riskier uh, to invest, no? and, and even the banks were not feeling comfortable with the uh, valuations that they were doing over their own assets because they were, they had uh, also some uncertainties, no? and that's what, one of the reasons why the whole market dried up. Of course, in Spain we also suffered a, a consolidation process that also impacted our capacity to to have uh, deals in the market. 
No, now uh, services uh, during the first quarter ha uh, and all of uh, last year have been working in intensively on how uh, to improve their recovery processes and they've uh, been devoted basically to improve as much as possible to make investors feel comfortable uh, with the new uh, current situation and, and, and things are, are starting to slowly turn around. Now, uh, we, we're still not at the same levels as uh, a year ago. No? Uh, the banks received their vaccine before we did. Uh, they, they they started uh, feeling a lot better. Uh, you look at their balance sheet and they seem to be fully cured uh, and COVID-free. Well, we are still afraid of, of doing a lot of the work in person that uh, eases and makes everything uh, simpler and easier for everyone. No? Uh, so the, 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 there will still be a, a a period that we'll be facing that it will be still full of uncertainty uh, and it's uh, everyone's job here uh, to try to make uh, the money feel comfortable no um, bruno was pointed out uh, pedro sorry was pointed out before that uh, there's been a, a decrease in, in competition in, in spain and it's true uh, uncertainty has made some people feel more reluctant to start putting their money into work uh, or a lot of their money into work in some uh, situation. No? And what we're seeing is something that Paul was also mentioning just a couple of minutes ago, that uh, even though processes are, are closing, they, they seem to be tighter on the number of people that are looking at them. No? And, and people uh, differentiate themselves more on what perspective they have of the market and what they can do with, uh, with the portfolios that they and that's when uh, the servicing partner starts becoming extremely relevant for the transaction because uh, the view of the servicer and their capacity has a huge impact on the capacity of the investor to win uh, that particular portfolio. No? And that's why we're seeing specialists, um, such as the ones we have in this panel, be more active over in the pro in winning uh, the portfolios that are being sold in the market than the big uh, servicers uh, are. No? Yeah, and, and let me pick you up there as well, Guillermo, and ask Manuel. Manuel, we haven't heard from you yet. But, uh, do you feel as an asset manager as well that this role of the servicing increasing in, in the past transactions that we've heard and for, for what is to come? How, how do you see a lot of positioning itself in, in this context? Well, uh, very little can be added on, on what has been already said. Uh, the feeling that we have in this house is that uh, uh, we are uh, certainly overworked, but we are underperforming in terms of, of, of closing deals. Because one, we have a very specific product that we buy, as I said, is residential squatter uh, assets. And there are few portfolios that, that, that they concentrate on that. It is true that we've seen some portfolios that they have a mix of different assets and may, may include this type of asset. But, but certainly, uh, the good news is that we do have uh, investor interest uh, and we are able also to co-invest if we need to, to. but uh, it's very difficult to, to, to close the deals because the asymmetry we are seeing still in prices, both in the primary and on the secondary market. And I guess we are hoping that the activity will recover probably in the second quarter of this year but uh, on the other part, if, if the regulation uh, regarding banks, uh, the moratoriums and all these uh, issues that we have and they are on, on, on site at this time, uh, it's going to be difficult to see the market activating unless the regulation gets tougher uh, on the banks and the secondary market reactivates a bit. That will be the view that we are having here. Thank you, Manuel. And, and just to give you the floor now, perhaps we, we move to the other to the other big topic that we had to discuss really on, on our markets, which is how does the future look like? I think, um, again, as an advisor and seeing the market evolving, I get a lot of calls from investors that they all uh, want to position themselves in, in the big, in the big, trend that we hear about, especially in Portugal, that is going to, there needs to be an overall solution for the level of NPLs that are coming. We will stop seeing bilateral sales because the amount of NPLs that, of moratoriums, given the COVID that will turn into NPLs, will require uh, an overall solution. 
So perhaps I think for the future trends, I would be curious to hear your opinions about whether there will be a global solution such as the ones we have in, in Spain, I believe, and also in Ireland or, or, or even in Italy with state guarantee and all that, or whether the market will just keep on going as it has in the past, regardless of the so-called volume that perhaps we cannot even say the numbers and the figures because they, they seem to be, they sound quite scary if we think about that all these moratoriums will, will turn into, into MPLs. Uh, and again, perhaps we, we, we can start with Paul. Uh, how do you see this trend? Do you feel like this is going to happen? Well, perhaps not in Spain, but uh, do you think moratoriums will turn into big volumes of NPLs? Is the market going to, to react just that, as it did in the, past, in the past few years? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's the big, the big question on everybody's mind at the moment. Like, you know, uh, what, what is the volume that's coming? Um, you know, I think what, what I've seen is that, um, you know, thinking back to, to maybe this time last year, like, you know, when we would have thought like, you know, there's going to be massive waves of, of MPLs coming. Um, you know, what we've seen is much more liquidity um, in the market than what we, we, we knew there was liquidity coming this time last year, but like, you know, not to the, to the extent that uh, the support that's been provided, no. Um, and that support is, is continuing. No, if you speak to the people in the banks, no, uh, they say, oh, we haven't, you know, there's no, there's no problem. In fact, you know, the banks have uh, really upped their capacity in terms of dealing with, um, you know, a stage three defaults, um, you know, or stage two defaults even, and, and it hasn't been at the level that everybody was expecting, no? So, um, so the question is, is it, uh, to what extent is it a deferral of the problem and to what extent, um, you know, will, will this deferral, you know, allow a lot more companies to, to survive and to continue? And uh, to what extent you know, will, 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 will it convert into, into MPLs, no? Um, that's the first question. And the second then is, is what type of MPLs are we going to have, no? Um, so, um, you know, I think in, in, in Spain, for example, it's affected different sectors differently, no? Um, so where the, the, the impact is on SMEs, the impact is on uh, and people in the tourism sector and the transport sector, you know? Um, and they've been affected and what we're, we're, we're saying is like, you know, uh, you know, depending on uh, the individual companies at what level of debt they had entering into the crisis uh, and, and what level of the impact is, will they be more or less affected? No? Um, um, I suspect it'll be a, a lot of unsecured SME type debt, you know, and that, that will be um, a big part of the wave that, that's coming. Um, uh, but I really don't have a, uh, a, you know, it's clearly there's going to be a level of MPLs, there's going to be a bet, and, and this, it's not sustainable, the level of default rates that the banks have at the moment, and that's going to increase. Um, but I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not sure, you know, how, how big of a, of, a, of a wave is going to come or not, and what type of that wave it's going to be. Yeah, that's the, the big question. Bruno. Um, I'll pass on to you just to hear about your global national solution that's going to save the whole of the NPL portfolios. What do you think? Oh, about uh, yeah, um, I, I think I agree with Paul when he says, you know, that's a big question. Uh, and honestly, I, I don't think no one can uh, really say the number that will uh, arise. Um, but if you look to Portugal and if you look to the level of loans that you have under moratorium, and that a significant percentage of those loans are actually SMEs. Um, and in my opinion, many of those SMEs are already zombie companies. So many of them will become definitely NPLs. So I think that you do see conditions in, 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 in the market to see an increase in the NPLs coming, uh, you know, you'll see an increase in NPLs. I'm quite sure of, the, of that. How much will be the impact? I don't know. If you speak with banks, each, each, each one of them will, will tell you a different story. Usually they'll tell you that they are fine. There is no problems. Um, but I usually say I'm, I'm a pessimistic optimistic. You know, when we were set up back in 2007, um, we, we, we were set up just before uh, the credit crunch. 
So we have been going from crisis to crisis, 2008, 2009, then 2011, 2012. And in all those crises, you have seen actually the market behaving uh, sometimes in a, an unexpected way. And uh, at the end of the day, things turn out to be, in some cases for investors, very good opportunities to invest. So when you look to the, to the number once again, and when you look to Portugal and you see the moratoriums, I would say that it's very expectable that you see the number increasing. Will there be a solution at the European level? Will, will there be a solution on individual state levels? I don't know. Once again, you keep hearing of solutions. I don't know. I've been hearing for, for, from, for different solutions for about, I don't know, 10 years. And at the end of the day, many of them don't really materialize. People speak a lot about having a European solution. And at the end, you don't see them. So I think you'll see probably more of what we've seen in the past. Maybe with, uh, of course, you'll need to reflect that if NPLs increase, even though, like Paul said, you do have a lot of liquidity in the market and you have an appetite on the market. But at the end of the day, um, I think you'll see a reflection of the increase of the NPLs also on pricing. But uh, yeah, we'll see. I think that's the big question. How will the market progress? Um, and what will be the impact of the moratoriums that we have, for instance, in Portugal until the end of September. And like I said, I think we'll see a big increase in NPLs, especially on the SME side. Manuel, uh, would, you, would you tend to agree with this, um, even if you're focused more on the residential sort of NPLs, uh, how, how do you prepare yourself for what is coming and for all these big question marks that everyone seems to have? Uh, well, I totally agree with, with what has been said. Uh, we estimate here, and, and there are some uh, external estimations that, that uh, they, they, they will confirm that the level of NPLs that we are having in Spain will, will go from the 80 billion level to uh, 160 billion. Uh, the difference with the prior crisis that we had was that the, the, the NPLs and the toxic assets were very much real estate related. Uh, and that was the creation of Sareb, where I come from, uh, and, 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 and we were dealing with, with these type of situations. The difference now, and I totally agree with, with Paul and with Bruno, is that we are going to be facing a huge level of NPLs coming from a small and medium enterprises. Uh, and you will have a bunch of that that will be secure, and we ha you will have a, another big bunch that will come from unsecured. Uh, as we now have going to the RESI part and going to the mortgages to individuals, we still have moratoriums being granted by, by the banks. Uh, we won't see the activity that we are buying coming uh, until probably 2022. Uh, but still, there are on the secondary market some some. Uh, deals that we are uh, pursuing and we are dealing on a bilateral basis with some small uh, uh, financial institutions. But uh, um, again... Can I just ask you one thing? Because obviously your previous experience in, in Sahel, uh, it's something that it's implemented in the Spanish market, but there's a lot of questions coming in the Portuguese market for, from players, whether we could replicate uh, 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 a transaction like Sareb and an entity like Sareb in Portugal. Can you just briefly, I know this is uh, asking in a very short time frame, but can you just tell us in two or two topics your experience there? How, how can that work from a, a global solution for the overall volume? Well, I think that the key element for, for a, 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 a bad bank to work is the transfer pricing. Uh, and uh, we've been comparing uh, Sareb with Nama. Uh, Sareb uh, was a big success in terms of restart, restarting uh, the real estate activity and recovering the economy. But certainly, and now it's obvious because it's stated, the level of losses that the company is having because we, or the company did overpaid uh, for, for, for the assets that they were buying. So for me, the key, issue for whatever solution that could be implemented in Europe is having a realistic transfer price. Because other than that, uh, what, what you will be accum accumulating over the years will be losses. So I think that we will have 
in at the European level, probably more regulation that will put every service in equal footing in the different countries. But uh, really, it, for me, it's difficult to, to oversee a, a global solution in Europe with a, a single institution. It's going to be more country-based, in my opinion. Thank you, Manuel. That's really helpful. Thank you. Guilherme, can I, can, I, can I ask you, I'm pretty sure you've received questions from investors about volumes and how do we deal with massive volumes of NPLs. What do you respond to that? Yeah, uh, sure. But yeah, yes, give me a second uh, for, to answer about the global solution, no? because I, I, I've been in discussion with the ECB and the SSM around a potential uh, global solution for all of the European countries. And there's uh, very little chances of that ever happening. No? Uh, there's too many different objectives in each country. Laws are different, recovery uh, processes are different. And even though there's space for a pan-European type of uh, recovery company, uh, having a pan-European bad bank uh, I, I think that even though it could be something good uh, and it could be helpful for Europe, it will be extremely difficult to get everyone to agree on a setup that will work for everyone. No? Now, uh, and about uh, the volumes uh, and the potential future trends. No? Now, uh, there's a huge cor correlation between each economy and the type of loans that are generated uh, as a result of no, the non-performing activity and the drop on GDP. No? In Spain, we have a, a, a huge drop in GDP over in the first uh, semester and last year, and basically everything that was cost to consumer related retail type of businesses uh, disappeared for a period of time. No? And uh, the Spanish economy is basically a SEB uh, economy with a couple of big uh, companies in, in between, but it, it, most of the value of our economy and most of the GDP is uh, sustained over the, the SME world. Now, all, all of these, or a lot of these companies have disappeared. No, it's not like a consumer debt that you know you don't pay, they can come after you the day after. When an SME disappears, it, it disappears forever. And the value that you can uh, recover from the, those situations is it, extremely difficult. Uh, I was mentioning before that the vaccine on the, of the within the banking system has helped uh, tackle some of these situations uh, through the banks, but it basically has delayed the problem uh, for the future. You know, if you look at the stage two uh, loans uh, within the banks, you see that there's a massive uh, amount of, of loans that are either being uh, governmental aided or there's some kind of, of moratoria or some type of, of agreement within between the bank and the company to keep them there alive and performing. Now, the, this is just optics. Uh, any, in, as soon as all this help and all these um, assistance, and as soon as the ECB and SSM start putting some pressure over in the banks to start recognizing the real problem that they have over in their balance sheets, uh, it starts, MPLs will start coming up in, uh, very, very um, rapidly. Will this mean that we will be transacting huge amount of volumes of SMEs uh, during this year? I doubt it. Uh, you, you still have to provision it. No? Now, uh, Paul was mentioning before that uh, we might see maybe at the end of the year some B or SME unsecured loans coming into the market. Th those might come because there's uh, those get provisioned sooner than the secured uh, pieces of uh, SME. No? Now, but we, we still need to focus on whether the banks, oh, sorry, the governments and the regulator will extend uh, the uh, lack of pressure over in the banks uh, to start recognizing their problem, or will they be still helping? If they continue helping uh, the, the banking system and the economy as a whole, then uh, the, the whole thing will shift down uh, and the problem will start mo moving forward. If they start, or if they start putting pressure on the economy, then we will see uh, a result uh, coming to the, the market as an increase in MPLs. A lot of banks are taking uh, the proper measures to reduce the amount of MPLs that will come in the future. No? But those uh, companies that I was mentioning before that disappear from one day to the other because the, the, the company itself cannot withhold a prolonged uh, time of uh, having zero uh, revenues, th those will never be recovered. 
uh, the amount of recoveries that any specialist might uh, bring out of those situations, it's extremely limited, no? And it will be difficult uh, to, to work out uh, those loans. So uh, in my, my best guess will be that probably sometime at the end of this year or the uh, or early next year, we will start seeing uh, unsecured SAP portfolios coming into the market and the secured portfolios will will have to wait an extra year for those uh, to, to start uh, popping up. Yeah, and Pedro, uh, we've heard a lot already about this, but um, I would be curious to see or to hear from you as well, these, these volumes and what banks are saying, Portuguese banks particularly, are saying in respect of how to deal with post-COVID moratoriums being over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> sure, and and I agree uh, mostly with everything that was uh, here commented, and I think the um, solutions, global solutions, will be on on a country by country approach. That's the only way possible. However, still difficult to implement because uh, like Bruno even mentioned, we've been here in the market for quite a while and, and no solution yet, 100%. We need to try and fail and try again. This will be obvious. Going to volumes, I, I believe banks in these last years have also uh, increased the sophistication and understood they need to the leverage. They've been doing a massive uh, work on that and all of us, we know because we've been here in this industry and growing year after year. And um, they've been prepared and trying to be prepared for new volumes. People in the market say, and I, I would not be surprised an increase of NPL at the moment between 10 and 15%, um, for sure, something in those lines. Even though the banks are trying to deliver and being ready for it, I think uh, nobody really knows what's gonna happen in terms of volumes and how quick. I think the NPL ratio will always raise year after year on a normal standards. And basically the COVID effect came to accelerate this moment. And, and what I think is crucial is not only the type that will come in terms of NPLs, because I think it's gonna be different than what we've been seeing, the volumes of NPLs, but don't forget, there will be a massive super farming loan also at the banks. And the question is, the super farming loans will or not create NPLs. And I know the banks will try to avoid and focus on the NPLs coming from the moratoriums at the moment, but the super farming loans will also happen. And to conclude and not to be too long on this question is, I think this effect will take at least three to six months. First, so the NPL is not eminent. Second, I think the banks still have NPLs in the book and most likely they will start by those NPLs in the book to try to clean up the house before it gets crowded again. And, and finally, and what we've been facing even last year is how quick the banks were able and obviously helped by all the sell advisors to create and to bring to the market new types of portfolios. And we saw that in super-forming portfolios, re-performing portfolios and rental REO portfolios. And it's incredible how sophisticated and how quick this industry is and people are able to turn it around quickly. And so I feel it will change a little bit the current NPL market as we see it today. And it will start by NPLs. And I think the REOs will have a second wave in one in two to three years from now, because we start by the NPLs, then come the REOs after. I think, I think very interesting years will come for all of us. And like we saw in the last three years, we need to be ready to new type of product, new type of volumes, and uh, big waves year after year again. Now, again, I'll pick it up there, just there, because I think as a, a, a final question to all of you, I think even from a more commercial standpoint, I would be curious to hear, based on what your experience, what do you think would be good uh, to happen in the future that could be important for your for your particular uh, company and business you're conducting like for example Manuel I'm turning to you as an asset manager what would you like to see change uh, it can be either uh, a legal a legal a new legal act that can help managers to do something different 
uh, or a, a policy, an European policy that can help on, on managing these, these, these loans. I think the question is to all of you, basically to understand based on your experience and what your companies do, what do you think could be an improvement? I mean, I can only speak as a lawyer. I think as a Portuguese lawyer working on MPLs, I think the courts still take too long. <laughs> it's as simple as that. From an LPL, NPL perspective, I think insolvency, foreclosures, they just take too long when everybody knows what's going to be the outcome. So these deadlines, there must be a way to deal with this, but this is just my personal view. But I'll turn to you and, and then to you all, given we have uh, less than um, a quarter of an hour to, to, to cover this, but it would be interesting to know what would you like to see that could help your, your NPL and real business? Manuel, I'll start with you, please. Uh, thank you very much. If I were to write uh, Santa's letter for next year, probably it will be uh, short and simple. What I will uh, ask is to have a very transparent, stable and reliable legal framework. I think that this is key. Uh, the judiciary processes in Spain, as you know, they are slow. Uh, uh, there is confusion depending on the region that, that you are whether or not you are able to um, uh, do evictions. Uh, we don't know exactly what, what is going to happen with the rentals in, in the Resi world. So basically, I think that the, the major comfort that we need as managers and the investors need as investors is a stable uh, legal framework, uh, which is not uncertain. So that, that will be my, my, my letter to Santa Claus. That's a, a different way to put the question, but I like it better. Paul, what would be your letter to Santa NPL? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, Manuel touched on it, um, which is the, the court system, and uh, both uh, from the uh, foreclosure point of view and uh, the also uh, the insolvency courts, no? Um, so, I mean, what I would be looking for is, uh, first of all, more resources, um, you know, for the court system, because um, I think we're going to have, uh, you know, a, a huge increase in insolvencies, you know, um, and uh, I think the, 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 the system needs to be, um, you know, properly resourced to deal with that. Um, and combined with that, uh, probably actually first is, you know, a look at some of the bureaucra bureaucratic procedures that have to go through in the courts, no? Um, and we've actually seen with, with COVID, like, you know, there's uh, certain things uh, that they've done to help speed things up, like, you know, uh, being able to do things by video conference, um, you know, being able to, um, you know, to, to, you know to, to make things more efficient, no? Um, you know, uh, so uh, continuation of those, looking at the bureaucracy and see how we can things can be made more efficient, um, and also more resources for the court system. Uh, that that's where I'd focus. Um, Bruno, do you want to take this one? Uh, look, I, I agree. I think everybody will pretty much say the same, which is I think that the main con concern um, will be, uh, or if we could ask that the courts take less time, they become more efficient, they work better. Because if you look especially on the insolvency side, which in some cases take uh, forever, and I think it's not just Spain, it's Spain, it's Portugal and in you know, several other countries. But speaking of Portugal, one of, of the, the issues that we have is that the insolvencies take for a very long time, which in, in some ways is kind of difficult to explain to some investors why they, they have the proceeds in court and they still need to wait for the proceeds to be paid and sometimes take a long, long time. So I think everybody would agree that we need a better and faster legal system. Um, even though I recognize that in, you know, in the last few years, you've seen some improvements, some things have changed and, and are on the right direction. There's a lot to be done, especially on the, on the insolvency side. Just a small note to say that, you know, if things were not perfect before COVID, after COVID, it became even worse because, uh, you know, courts have stopped, they were not working. Um, and the, all that has an immediate impact on your business plans, on what you forecasted for your clients. And, uh, and all that needs to be taken into account. So, yeah, uh, please, 
if they can uh, change the legal system, make it more efficient, because it definitely affects everyone. Thank you. Yeah, well, can we hear something different from courts and, and judicial? Yes. No, I, I, I would wish for world peace. No, but, but uh, aside from that, uh, I mean, uh, a little bit of pressure from the regulator in order for, for the banks to start um, showing a, a more realistic uh, balance sheet, I think that that would be helpful for all of the market. Um, core proceedings, uh, transparency, timing wise, and recoveries uh, are very good, but if there's no product being sold, uh, you cannot do your, your workouts, no? So I think that uh, we, I will be wishing uh, to have uh, more transactions coming to the market and that's basically done through pressure from the regulator. Pedro. Yes, I actually make, makes a lot of sense what Jeremy was saying. I think people need to understand uh, one very clear thing. We can change. Look what happened in one year with COVID. People had a massive need to change. So we can change. So people need to understand if we can change, let's like improve. And I think some improvements have been made by the, the, the push and the necessities of uh, the COVID that people had to face. And, and I think this will change forever the world. This will not be a, a one moment, two years moment. This will be a, a massive change. This will help for sure and can show people, not only in the judicial system, uh, that they can improve. And, and we can and we should benefit from all of this. And like Guillermo was saying, I also feel we need uh, the regulator and the ECB to be able to understand, obviously giving some bread to the banks and, and to the economy, but you also need to put some rules and be sure people uh, understand the rules are to be accomplished and not uh, always uh, being crying or being uh, hopefully uh, writing to Santa for a postpone or an initial time. So I think what I would wish to Santa obviously is people, please take the opportunity to change. Let's improve now and the ECB to give direct rules for us to be able to get portfolios as well. Um, thank you, Pedro. Um, I don't know if there are questions coming from, from the audience and we would be happy to take them on board. Um, I think what we've heard, thank you all for, for joining the panel and for participating. Um, I think um, the outcome of this discussion is pretty clear to everyone. Uh, there will be deals to come yet. Uh, we all wish for, for a better legal and more stable legal system that can help dealing with these NPLs, including from a regulatory standpoint. And again, I can only thank you for, for joining the panel and, and can't wait to see you all physically, I should say. I think we're all getting also tired of long distance calls and, and teams and not meeting face to face. But the time will come and I would like to end with a positive note. I'll be happy to receive you all in a 3DA whenever you're in Lisbon and we can then further discuss whatever you feel like. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you gentlemen, you. For, for joining. You. Really great discussion and Tiago for moderating. It's much appreciated. So. Um, like like Tiago said, hope to see you all uh, when we get back to doing live events because it's about time. So have a good afternoon and thank you. Mm -hmm.